I think last time I was here, uh, we may have closed on the uh, transaction. I believe we had, but um, Dana invited me back to uh, give an update on where things stand now that phase one is, is complete and what we might have uh, planned for the future. So we'll do that. Um, there were really cool photos up here at the site prior to construction. What a mess it was, but I think everybody probably remembers uh, what the four acres um, in downtown looked like prior to the project. Um, certainly the courthouse, the Hotel Putnam, and the Winslow building, all from an exterior perspective, looked really viable and um, very attractive historic buildings. Um, but behind those facades, there wasn't a whole lot of activity. Um, the Greenberg store was vacant um, at that point. Uh, and um, Winslow had a number of kind of uh, decrepit buildings. The Winslow building is actually five buildings that had been built over uh, a series of years. So on that four acres in the heart of downtown at the time of that acquisition, um, those buildings were 90% vacant. Uh, there hadn't been any upper floor uses since the late 1970s. Uh, I think people are familiar with the Brooks House redevelopment of Brattleboro, and in many ways, uh, this project mirrored that with a old hotel right at the main intersection in the heart of downtown. In the Brooks House case, um, there was a fire there and the building was decimated. So pretty easy for the community to rally around a burned out hulk in the middle of downtown and realize you need to do something about it. It's a little harder to get a community to rally around buildings that from the outside look okay, but from the inside are vastly underutilized and have been for 40 years. So that was one of our challenges with Putnam was to get this kind of sense of urgency built up about the need to do something with these historic structures in the heart of our community. And fortunately, um, we have some uh, pretty, uh, pretty good ears willing to jump in and, and give it a shot. And I think people are by now pretty familiar with the partners uh, that made up the Bennington Redevelopment Group, led by some of those large institutional anchors, uh, Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, uh, the Bank of Bennington, uh, and Bennington College and then sprinkled in with a number of business and private investors um, as well. They kind of rounded out that core investment group uh, that at the end of the day, uh, down the road, will um, be the, the, the owners of the uh, Putnam Block redevelopment. That group really um, hung in through thick and thin as we moved from an option agreement in June 2016 through the creation of a at that point, $27 million funding stack in late fall of 2017, when Congress then passed the Tax Cut and Job Act and the, new, the pricing on tax credits dried up completely and that whole funding stack fell apart and we had to start from scratch uh, at the end of 2017. So it took us till June of 2019 to piece that back together. Uh, the pricing on tax credits certainly didn't get any better, but one thing that did come out of the Tax Cut and Job Act was the ability to create opportunity zones. And we were fortunate uh, in Bennington, uh, there were 25 uh, total possible for the state of Vermont. Bennington had two eligible census tracts uh, that could be designated as opportunity zones, one in downtown, one in the uh, northeastern corner of town. And we were fortunate to get them both designated by Governor Scott uh, as opportunity zones. As it worked out, uh, an opportunity fund was the last $3.75 million that came in uh, to create our now 30, well, at the time of closing, $31 million funding stack. Uh, due to COVID, total price on the project ballooned to 32 and a half. Um, I think people are familiar with how the community participated uh, in the Putnam Block redevelopment through that leadership equity group that I mentioned. Those were people or organizations or institutions that put in a minimum of $100,000 and took all the risk up front before we even knew if there was a project. And um, I think in every case, um, everybody put in more than $100,000 and in many cases, substantially more than $100,000. Uh, and um, in at least two cases, up over half a million dollars in that leadership equity um, group. There were also um, over 50 members of the community, in, uh, individuals and institutions who put in some form of preferred equity. Um, and those generally came in uh, in two ways. One, through uh, actual preferred equity in the project, which is earning a 3% return um, for those investments uh, annually. And uh, those were in $25,000 minimum investments. And um, we 
we generated about, I think, three and a half million dollars in uh, preferred equity. Those are your friends and neighbors who um, decided that they would like to invest uh, some of their money in a project they believed in to improve the community uh, with the hope that they'd get a 3% annual return and the hope and expectation that in 10 years or so when we uh, refinance this project as a traditional real estate investment, that initial investment will be repaid. So, um, all, and then there were others who, because of the affiliation with the project with Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and Bennington College, made tax deductible donations to those two institutions, took their tax write off, and asked those institutions to pass that money through uh, as their equity into the project. So those were that was another way uh, that community members were able to participate. And again. All told, uh, among those three kind of groups, we have over 60 uh, people or institutions in the community that have some form of investment uh, in the Putnam Block, which I think for community Bennington side is really, size is really phenomenal, just simply incredible. Um, and then certain of those uh, uh, leadership folks would also serve as committed tenants in phase one. The primary tenant uh, from the leadership group in phase one is Bennington College who have their development offices now on the second floor of the Winslow building in just glorious space with cube skylights and a rooftop deck. Uh, and they also have uh, 13 micro apartment units that will be used uh, eventually uh, as grad student housing for the college. We missed, because of the uh, delay in COVID, we missed the start of the uh, school year this year. So those uh, 13 units have actually gone on the market um, and were rented like that to the market, um, so uh, really fortunate uh, there. Um, I would love to be able to show you the funding stack and the 17 different funding sources that came in that got us to our $31 million, $34,630 oh, on June 19th, 2019 when we closed and were able to begin um, construction uh, on the project. But I think, I think everyone here is probably familiar with the story. 31 million, now 32 and a half million invested in the project. We have a post-completion valuation of 8.5 million. So, great deal. Invest 32 and a half, get 8.5. Who's gonna turn that opportunity down, right? <laughs> so, that's the challenge. That's the challenge in rural America. That's the challenge in trying to do uh, real estate investment in places like Bennington, really anywhere in Vermont, with the possible exception of Chittenden County and most of rural America. The market dynamics simply don't support the cost of construction to do these types of projects. So you need to get creative and find ways uh, to backfill that two thirds plus or minus gap. Uh, and in our case, we were able to do that through this raise of equity that we talked about, through the Opportunity Zone funding that I talked about, and through a variety of uh, tax credits, federal tax credits, federal rehab tax credits, uh, for historic uh, preservation in all three of the historic buildings. The Vermont Downtown Tax Credits, which ride on top of that um, as an additional investment because Bennington's a, de a designated downtown. And New Market Tax Credits, which are um, an investment vehicle created by Congress now about nine years ago and into its fourth iteration. Um, and that was really the big kind of swing. That represented about eight and a half million of that 31 million dollar funding stack is new market tax credits. And the beauty of new market tax credits is when we get through the seven year compliance period of new market tax credits um, and we're in compliance, those things completely wash off the balance sheet and go away. So that eight and a half million camp comes in, we do what we uh, said we're going to do with regard to the project and, and are in compliance, they go away, drop off the balance sheet at the end of uh, the seven year compliance period, and then you have about a three year period where you can hopefully uh, refinance it with simply traditional debt based on the value um, generated by the rents in, in the building. So uh, that's the plan. In addition, there were some additional funding sources, community development block grants, um, a $350,000 revolving loan from the town of Bennington, um, some money from Efficiency Vermont, uh, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board put some money in uh, for uh, workforce housing, uh, which is supported in the project, and then some EPA grants uh, to assist in uh, the, the uh, environmental cleanup of the site. So again, all told, that got us to $31 uh, million and some change. Um, the delay um, and shutdown due to COVID, construction went off site, had to remobilize, cost of construction, the 
materials, as everybody knows. It wasn't the same coming out of COVID as it was going into COVID. And uh, all told, uh, the leadership investors reached into their pocket and came up with another million and a half dollars of cash uh, to get this project to uh, the finish line uh, in November. So here are the photos that you can see of um, kind of the inside spaces. We are planning uh, in October um, when the restaurant um, is open, mid to late October, um, a, an open house for the community to come in and tour uh, the spaces throughout all three of the buildings. Um, and I think people will be really excited to, to see what has happened um, within, uh, within each of those three historic buildings. Uh, I should note that uh, substantial com we had to hit a substantial completion on the project to maximize the amount of federal historic tax credits. We had a deadline of uh, November 30th of uh, 20, losing track, 2020, uh, so last November. And um, we got the certificate of occupancy for substantial completion from the town of Bennington uh, building inspector serving on behalf of the state um, at 3.30 uh, p.m. on November 30th. So hour and a half to spare. Uh, just like we did with the original closing um, in June of 2019, in order for the more than 30 various um, uh, electronic wire transfers to happen, at that closing day, everything had to be completed at the Bank of Bennington by 3 p.m. We got the last document in at uh, about 2.55 uh, that day. So nothing on this has been easy, but everything um, thus far has, has certainly gotten done. So um, tenant updates. I think this is probably where people are interested. I think you probably were familiar with most of the story that, uh, that I just shared. As for tenants, um, at this point in the courthouse, um, people may have seen the Bennington Bookshop as uh, moved in is open uh, for business, so that's um, the first kind of first floor commercial tenant um, that's open. We have a signed lease for a coffee shop, um, which will be under fit up in the next few weeks, which is immediately adjacent on the first floor uh, to the bookshop, and we'll have a pass through. So, coffee and books that's a really cool concept. Um, and then upstairs, fit ups underway for Global Z to um, move its IT business and its 35 or so employees onto the second floor of the courthouse. And again, on open house day, people will be able to get up there, but I know Jane and others have, have seen it. Um, you know, 30 foot ceilings, 16 uh, foot windows back there. The windows on the west side hadn't been open for decades and just glorious views up to, uh, up to Mount Anthony uh, from, from that space. So that building is, is full. Uh, in the hotel, come back to residential in a moment, uh, 100 seat restaurant will be going into the old South Street Cafe space, doubled plus. So where South Street Cafe was, was only a small portion of what was actually that building. The walls um, behind where the bathrooms were uh, in South Street Cafe have come down and it extends back uh, probably 70 or 80 feet um, towards the back and there's outdoor seating on both sides access off the parking lot off of Franklin Lane. So again, that's uh, fit up is underway. Uh, target opening around uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, um, Columbus Day uh, in mid-October if everything goes well. Uh, pet grooming and supply store is open um, in the old uh, barbershop space. Um, on the first floor, we have a lease with a hair salon, uh, which will be uh, going into the space immediately adjacent. Uh, and then a national brokerage firm has a pending lease um, for uh, space in the hotel Putnam as well. And we're working on a, uh, a deal with Bennington Potters, the Bennington Museum, and Vermont Arts Exchange to potentially occupy and have kind of a welcome center, Vermont products, um, Bennington, I'm sorry, Bennington products uh, space at the corner space right there at the heart of, uh, of downtown. So we're hoping um, we can make that happen. That would leave one space open um, at the end of the building if people are familiar where uh, Isabella's was, that most westerly portion of the Hotel Putnam, uh, that space is open. And then finally, in the Winslow building, uh, the visiting nurses um, have about 7,000 square feet um, accessible uh, with the main entrance off the parking lot, off of Franklin Lane. Uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center has some public facing office space uh, on the second floor. Bennington College Development Office is up there and we're working um, to develop a letter of intent for a grocery occupant um, in the Winslow space as well. If that comes to be, there would be just one small 
uh, first floor space um, in Winslow. So residential, those are the commercial type spaces on the first floor and um, second floor with the case of Global Z and uh, Bennington College. Residential spaces, there are 13 residential spaces in the Winslow building. They're all micro slash efficiency apartments, 400-ish square feet. Um, and those are 100% uh, leased um, with a lease ranging at $753 a month to $1,100 a month uh, for those units. And those, uh, the tenants pay their own uh, heat and electric in that case. The owner pays, uh, pays property taxes. Uh, on the Hotel Putnam, second and third floor, 18 residential units made up of uh, two efficiency units, similar to what I just described, 11 one-bedroom units, and five uh, two-bedroom units. And those are also leased. There are waiting, um, waiting lists for all of those units. Um, and in the case of the two bedrooms, there's a waiting list more than three times longer than the number of available units. Um, and those units are renting from between $821 a month to $2,400 a month, which simply I don't think I don't think any of us thought uh, $2,400 a month for a two-bedroom in Bennington um, was going to be possible when we went into this project. But um, that's what the market is, uh, is suggesting. And again, we have a waiting list uh, many times longer than the available units for uh, for those units. So, um, and the rent the rent ranges are so diverse um, because nine of the units across the two buildings. Um, qualified under that workforce housing um, grant slash loan that I talked about from the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. So those are dedicated to people who are making between 80% and 120% of the median income for um, the Bennington region. So those people are uh, income checked when they go in and have to meet, fall within those income cri uh, criteria, right at 80 to 120%. So a little bit of upfront work, but it prov uh, provides a really kind of diverse um, housing arrangement there, which is exactly uh, what we had hoped for uh, as we launched the project. You know, it's interesting, we did, um, we did a survey of young professionals uh, who were ramping up to this project with regard to their housing needs. Um, young professionals being a really uh, a target audience that everybody thought, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had more young people living in downtown? Well, if you were, in, if you were downtown last Friday night, uh, by chance, you would have seen almost nothing but young people, and many, many young people uh, in downtown Bennington. But on the survey, um, with regard to the income brackets, we found it, it broke down almost exactly a third, a third, a third. Uh, young professionals who would qualify for the traditional, quote, affordable housing, which is 60% of median income or lower, um, a third of those young professionals were in that workforce, 80 to 120% of median income housing, and a third of those young professionals were at 120 plus, which is quote unquote market rate housing, which is as we build out the whole block and get to what we hope will be ultimately 105 units of housing there, building off of um, the 31 that we have now, um, that is the almost the exact breakdown of what is intended for housing uh, on the block, which you know we think is, is pretty cool. Um, hopefully some of you came to the, to the open house, uh, I'm sorry, the groundbreaking celebration in August of, uh, uh, 2019, uh, when we broke ground on that, the governor was here, um, folks from all over the country, and I really wish, um, you know, one of the one of the comments was from an, an executive at U.S. Bank Corp, who um, assisted with a kind of tax credit uh, financing, and they do these types of projects all over the country. Uh, and Ben Alderton from U.S. Bank Corp at the groundbreaking said. Uh, this is the most complex real estate project the U.S. Bank Corp has ever been involved in. And I'll pass this around since I can't show it. And the details don't really matter. But this is the flow chart of funding, closing, uh, and ownership at the, uh, at the Putnam Block. And what we had to pull together to make all the pieces fit um, for uh, Putnam Phase 1. So that's Phase 1. Uh, with regard to uh, Phase 2, we have a related group called uh, Putnam Community Health, LLC. It has some of the same members as uh, the Bennington Redevelopment Group. It has some different members. And some of the members of the original group are not participating in, uh, we like our acronym, so we're going to go with PCH um, LLC, which is, will be the ultimate owner of Phase 2, and currently controls the remaining um, about two acres of property 
um, there. So early stages uh, of planning there. Um, pretty excited in that we have letters of intent from uh, Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and the Vermont State College System to bring clinical office use and educational space totaling about 25,000 square feet uh, to phase two. So right now phase two is looking like one building, 55,000 or so square feet, four to five stories depending upon the configuration, which would have some retail liner space, a few retail spaces to create some vibrancy on the street. Um, SBAC medical, two clinical uses, probably express care and some other use with a partner depending on who the who the partner is, could be a wound care, could be a dialysis, could be something else, um, but about 10,000 square feet of clinical use, 15,000 square feet of educational, and what we're intending to be um, an additional 30 residential units. So we're in feasibility analysis phase of that. If um, we're hoping through feasibility in the fall, start um, looking for uh, developers and, and financers um, late fall into early 2022 and would hope to be in construction probably in early 2023 if everything goes well, which as we know rarely does, but that's the, that's the approximate time. So that's the overview. Um, phase one complete, um, becoming increasingly vibrant by the day. Lots of new people. I mean, I, I don't know about you folks, but I'm so excited every time I drive through downtown at night now and see upper floors of the hotel, you know, with lights on and we know that people are, are living up there. It's a, it's a pretty exciting, uh, pretty exciting time. Uh, and we know a lot of other pretty exciting activity is happening in and around downtown uh, Bennington, which I know the investment group would like to think is due at least in part to kind of them taking the risk on Bennington and other people now uh, following along. So happy to do, uh, address, uh, answer any questions that anybody might have. Here. With all this proposed, where will parking be? Uh, every, everything would be parked on site behind the buildings. So we've done the parking analysis and there's plenty of parking there for actually, um, we had done an analysis of um, on site parking that would have included in a third building, which is probably not going to happen um, on the corner uh, where the mobile station currently is located. Um, so everything could be accommodated on site easily um, takes advantage uh, as well of the, uh, the adjacent municipal site um, National Guard will be vacating the armory there's a lot of parking there also takes advantage of the parking behind the Community College of Vermont so lots of easily accessible parking uh, permits have been easy with that uh, access to parking no need to, to develop any type of uh, structures uh, although we have had some conversations with uh, the credit union about possibly doing some overflow parking um, behind their space along the, along the river if we get uh, that becomes necessary. But everything can be handled on site with no new, uh, no new structures necessary. Okay. Does the current or the latest configuration for, um, for the second phase in include or keep that mobile station or is that still going to go as part of that? Yeah, TBD. Um, I think that's something the group is wrestling with right now. Um, does it, does it do something immediately adjacent to Old Castle, leave the corner open for some hoped for future development, or does it kind of finish the block and you know, kind of call it a day? With the understanding that you know, I failed to mention, but there is an option agreement um, with Evernorth, which is the former Housing Vermont and Shires Housing for the uh, corner at Washington and Franklin, so kind of where the lumber trees are currently um, for the, green, uh, the old Greenberg lumber trees. There's a one acre parcel there that's subject to an option agreement in which Evernorth uh, Shires would build 30 affordable housing units. So that would then complete the block. So my best guess is the group is leaning towards going all the way out to the corner and working back and whether that becomes some additional park area between Old Castle and that new building or whether it's simply an elongated lower building to make up the square footage, I think we'll, you know, all those decisions will happen. Dana. What else is happening with uh, BCRC, BCIC? I mean, what else are you working on? Yeah, so... I mean, uh, that's, this is a fraction of what you're working yeah, on. Yeah, it's just a small fraction, yeah. uh, for sure. So we are um, we are partnering <coughs> with the uh, Southwestern Bot Healthcare um, to do a, an RFP for 
uh, reuse of the former Southern Vermont College slash Everett campus. So we've provided a draft um, to them of some possible reuse scenarios and uh, we'll be working with them um, ultimately to try to find uh, developers to take over certain aspects of um, Southwestern Vermont healthcare. And um, we are working with the, the town of Bennington and Energizer on a reuse plan for the former Energizer facility. Uh, public meeting, a virtual public meeting, you might have seen the article in the banner last week, coming up on that uh, on Wednesday. Uh, we also have a survey out um, as part of that project. We're doing a community-wide housing uh, assessment to try to identify housing needs uh, within the community. Traditionally, when you do these types of reuse plans, you'll look at you know what's possible with regard to housing at the Energizer site, or what's possible with regard to housing at uh, Southwestern, at, at the old SBC site, or the Bennington Brush facility, or the old Catamount facility, depending on what you're working on. But with everything that's in play right now, and all of these potential sites, and all of this interest and need uh, for housing, we're expanding that to try to take in, uh, with our consulting partners, Kamoin, take in an understanding of what, we, what is the real demand and opportunity for the creation of housing across Bennington, including Energize, including these other sites, and try to get a handle on the, on the true demand. So that's a, that's a pretty important project that will be um, an outcome uh, of, uh, of that reuse plan. Uh, and then we're doing our kind of general um, you know, business support activities. Throughout the pandemic, uh, since the beginning, we've worked with over 400 businesses to assist them in some form of, of uh, financing to kind of make it through the initial stages of, uh, of the pandemic and now you know, start to emerge into something uh, bigger and better. So that work continues. It's now transitioned to you know, recovery and in some cases um, growth mode, but uh, we're engaged with you know, businesses throughout and you know, our region includes up to, uh, up to Dorset uh, on the north. So we're you know, Powell to Dorset um, working with, uh, again, closing in now on 500 businesses since uh, March of uh, 2020. Industry, is there any hope or anything on the Where, I mean, so there is, but right now the, the bigger concern is not new industry coming here, it's how, how, who are you gonna find to work in the existing industry? There's not a single local manufacturer, frankly, I don't know if there's a single local business that isn't looking uh, for employees. So we can't we can't possibly be in the mode of trying to attract new business here if you can't you can't find employees uh, for the businesses that are already here and uh, you know trying to survive and ultimately uh, trying to grow uh, it's just you know I don't know if anybody saw the CNBC rankings of uh, most friendly business states uh, yes it came out yesterday Vermont ranked 42 we were number one in the country on uh, life health and um, inclusion, we were number 50 on the workforce. So according to CNBC's assessment, we have the least available workforce in the country. So can't be thinking about bringing new business here. We need to be thinking about how do we get new people here to work in, um, in the businesses that are trying to grow. And they're all trying to grow. Um, we just helped um, Mac Molding secure the second largest um, workforce training grant in the history of Vermont uh, last week can't share the number yet, but it's a big number, um, and it's an exciting number uh, because it will train 350 employees with a target of 100 new employees uh, at MAC, which really further anchors them as one of our most critical employers um, in the region, in this region. You know, they're in five different states. So they can go a whole bunch of places. Um, they really are making a commitment to, uh, to Arlington and to, and to southwestern Vermont. What's most exciting about their Vermont Training Program grant for every dollar that comes in uh, from the state in this program, the uh, business has to match at least one dollar. So it's a major uh, corporate investment in training uh, its it, uh, indigenous employees and hopefully new employees. But right now it's about finding workforce, it's not about finding new businesses. All right, a follow-up question. Sure. What does survey show about why uh, high school and college graduates are not relocating or staying in why are they all leaving if you don't have any workers? Yeah, um, you know, I think some of that is about, um, although I think it's changing, I think some of that traditionally is about the availability of jobs. I think more of it is about what they perceive as greener pastures and more exciting things to do with their young lives as they get out of college than what's available in Bennington. 
Um, increasingly, we're seeing people uh, in their 30s and uh, early 40s still kind of prime childbearing age relocating back to this region as they start to contemplate next phases of their life uh, and the possibility of you know, starting a family. So, and certainly, uh, as a result of the pandemic, you know, we saw people throughout relocate to this region. You know, I think everybody's familiar with what's happened with housing prices. Um, and you know, the surveys there show that people who relocated from the city during the pandemic, roughly a third of them said, nope, that's a permanent relocation, we're staying here. And about a third of them have said, mm, yeah, we don't know. It's, it's gonna be a second home at least, and maybe a permanent home. Um, and then a third of them say, no, we're probably gonna go back uh, to our urban environment once things settle down. So we'll see how that sugars out. Um, but certainly, um, we've seen a lot of real estate activity. Uh, I think the market demand for the units at uh, Putnam uh, reflects uh, that market activity, um, certainly. So um, increasingly, I think we're, we're seeing a younger demographic. And again, if you happen to be downtown last Friday night, you would be really impressed with the number of young people um, that were out and about in, in downtown Bennington. Increasingly, with Farm Road Brewing and 421 Craft and, uh, and now, Union, uh, Union South, which will be the hotel, uh, the restaurant in the hotel, open or in the process of opening. Uh, there's a lot of new kind of exciting options for younger people in, in downtown Bennington. Any other questions? Great, thanks very much, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity.